Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Come on and take your seats. I got a tough act to follow, two great speakers, and now after lunch, I get to do my spiel. <laughs> so I hope you don't fall asleep. I'm just gonna kind of give you a, a report about what's been going on or what I've been seeing. So, uh, yeah, so just a, a little bit of review for 2017. Um, I don't know what you guys experienced, but our winter weather last winter uh, was really not that bad. Um, when we did our winter death loss survey, the death, overall death loss was up 8% from the year before. I think it was very interesting, kind of in line with what um, um, Randy and Jerry said earlier. People that did nothing to control varroa mite lost about 48% of their colonies this past winter, those that participated with our survey. Um, we had a tough spring, though. Uh, in March, the weather got really cold. And um, even into early April. Uh, I had work in my own bees even this spring. There were days I was dressed in a hooded sweatshirt and the wind was cutting me so hard while I was trying to work them. It was really, really miserable. You couldn't hardly see what was going on on the frames because the bees were, were, were two and three deep over top of the combs. So we had a tough, cold spring. Sometimes the bees went backwards. Some of my colonies, if I wouldn't have fed them, strategically fed them at that point, they would have starved out because we had a, a, a long period of time, seven, eight days where they really couldn't fly. And we had a cold snap that killed a lot of the plants that had already started blooming. Some of the trees had started to bloom and it got, they got whacked back. Um, this year, I was a little concerned because of the new antibiotic regulations. Um, last year, we had a tremendous amount of European fowl brood. This year, very little, and I was thankful for that um, because uh, a lot of people did not have a relationship with a veterinarian. It would have been tough for them to get tetracycline if they didn't already have a supply or have a, have a relationship with a veterinarian that was on board with, what, with, with these new regulations. Um, the online reg registration, um, I don't know if you've used it. I hope if you're sitting in this room, you've used the online Department of Agriculture registration. Works very, very well. Um, I haven't heard of hardly any problems, except what some people have done is if they did not know they were already in the system, they have just re-registered as a new registration. Now they have two registrations in there, which is very confusing for me. Um, and it requires me to go through the IT department to get their new registration removed and then notify the beekeeper of their apiary inspection number so they, they can redo it again next year. Um, I would just stress to you guys that if you're in that system, um, to make sure that your email address is correct because that's the best way for me to contact you. Um, so online registration works very well this year. Um, pestic the DEP pesticide notification, we kind of merged the two registrations together. So if you want to be notified of a pesticide application within uh, three miles of your apiary, you need to check the box when you do your Department of Ag registration to make sure that you will be notified of that. And you need to have your registration renewed uh, probably by the middle of February because I send them a list the latter part of February and that's the list they work off of and I can't update it throughout the year. So you need to make sure your apiaries are registered if you want to be notified so that, that your information can get to DEP uh, before uh, the 20th of February. Um, varroa levels went sky high last fall. Uh, it was alluded to with the first two speakers about varroa bombs. Um, I know that a friend of mine was working with the Bee Informed Partnership and actually painted um, a lot of bees. The new uh, Delaware State Apiarist who's with us today, Megan McConnell, and they found those painted bees in every other apiary within two miles of the colony that was collapsing. Um, just to give further evidence that this is what happens. Bees abscond or leave the colony that's doomed to die with the mites and viruses they have and drift into all the neighboring colonies and that is a way that people get reinfected. We had beekeepers that had their mite levels very low in September and then in October they were back up seven, eight percent again. And that's really what 
how we believe it happened. Um, this past year was the first year for this uh, uh, veterinary prescription for, for tetracycline or teramycin. And in New Jersey, um, the, way it, the way it will probably work is if you have a pet or already have a veterinarian you have a relationship with, I would talk to them about uh, your ability to have them write the, uh, um, the VFR, Veterinary Feed Directive, for, um, for you to be able to get tetracycline if you need it, if you have European fowl brood in your colonies. Um, there's also a large animal veterinarian who will write the prescription, but you have to develop a relationship with him um, prior to when, um, when you need it. What I did was I, I wanted to see how this whole thing works. So last uh, January, I called this guy up. He's on the, the BVET website. If you Google search BVET, uh, it's Acorn Valley Veterinary Clinic or something. He goes all over the state doing herd health for large cattle, uh, dairy, and beef operations. And he said, well, in two weeks, I'll be going right by where you live. We'll make arrangements that I'll stop and check out your, your apiary. You can show me your bees. We can talk about your management and develop that relationship, which is what I did. And then if I need it, I can call him up and say, hey, doc, I've got European fowl brood. I need to get some tetracycline, blah, blah, blah. And he lickety split, it'll go through. So um, that's something you may want to consider, especially talking to your, to your if a veterinarian that you already have a relationship with, if you have a relationship with any. Um, this past spring, we had a lot of swarming before the main honey flows uh, started or midway through them. And I, in my opinion, I know in South Jersey, below Mount Holly, the honey crop was very poor. And in large part, it was because the bees uh, swarmed uh, prior to the main flows coming on. And then by the time they righted themselves and became queen right again and started building their population, they'd already lost half the population. And that severely decreased um, the surplus honey that they made. Um, so that's something that we really don't want. I, Randy's talk on, on seeing how the, the colony population builds, adding in those open combs, as you see you, your colony running out of space in the brood nest to try to prevent swarming is a very good, good thing to keep in mind and to put into practice. Um, so that's just kind of so far what I've seen this year. I will add something that I just noticed since before I did this talk. Um, if you're, if you're in New Jersey, if you're in a goldenrod area, have, have you had a good goldenrod flow? If you did, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, normally, in my experience, I run into most goldenrod right around Burlington County. And normally it starts around the second week of September. This year, it really didn't start for where my bees were in that neck of the woods until just about five, six days ago. So I was getting very skeptical. The brood nest didn't really look that great and was getting ready to have to feed them. I was pleasantly surprised last week when I, I checked some colonies around there and there was just juice coming in everywhere, okay? You, you may or may not know this, but goldenrod, for whatever reason, does not produce every year. Just because you see beautiful flowers doesn't mean you're going to get nectar out of them. Um, some years we get nothing. Other years, we get an abundance. And it would behoove you to, um, you're not gonna be able to really judge it from the outside. You gotta be in the colonies, looking at the combs, seeing what's going on. So uh, you just can't, managing bee, honeybees requires you to be in the colonies, looking at what's going on. So I just say that because if, if you think you're getting goldenrod and you're not getting goldenrod, and that's what you're counting on to put your bees to bed for the winter, um, and you don't check them till the middle of October, you could be really behind the eight ball. Oh, I did put a slide in about that. Okay, if you're in South Jersey, but in the Pines or down below uh, Red Lion Circle or the Route 70, where Route 70 cuts across the state, more than likely your bees, I've seen a lot of bees down there that were on the verge of starvation. Okay, and if you don't feed, feed them to fatten them up, 
you're not going to make them through the winter if, if you're from that part of the, of the state. So it's really important to know what's going on inside the colony, um, see what your brood looks like. I got a slide coming up of cannibalized brood. Typically what happens, as you heard in one of the previous speakers, is the bees will eat back the eggs, then they start eating the larva, then it looks like you have a queenless colony, but in fact you don't have a queenless colony, you have a colony that's being starved to death. And beekeepers, Dottie Harvey told me, they're still calling for queens, they're going and getting a queen from her, putting a queen in a colony that is on the verge of starvation because they think they're queenless and they're just throwing more good money after bad money because they don't really understand what's going on in the colony. Um, so a little bit of syrup on a, on a colony that's starting to cannibalize its brood, as long as the mite levels are under control, uh, you should see brood very quickly after you, after you apply some feed to them. Um, Another question or comment that I get very often from beekeepers is, I'm coming up on 42 days, so I'm gonna pull my apivar out. If you're using apivar, apivar works best if it's left in for the maximum amount of time. And you can go 56 days according to the label, and I would advise you to leave it in as long as, as you're legally allowed to do it. Because it works best if the bees, if the mites are exposed to it over a longer period of time and multiple cycles of brood emerge. Um, that's really one of the reasons it works so well. Um, check your levels as was already said earlier today, and I've been saying this for years. I mean, I might sound like a broken record, but a lot of beekeepers don't do it. You got to check what you have before, check what you have a couple weeks after, so you know if whatever treatment you did had any positive effect. If you don't look or you make assumptions, you're going to be in trouble, okay? You can't assume anything in the bee business. And the other thing is, always leave an upper entrance for the winter. I fielded a lot of questions just recently where people were telling me that they wanted to seal the whole hive up and just leave an inch or two space available at the bottom. That is not a good idea to do, okay? You want to protect your hive from mice, but you want to make sure that you leave some sort of way for moisture to be vented out of the top of the hive. Some people in New Jersey will put a, a piece of foam insulation on top of the inner cover and then the outer cover, um, but they leave a notch, they leave it notched so that moist air can vent out. And as, as you heard in Randy's presentation, he talked about preventing condensation from dropping right on the bees, let it condensate on the, out, on the inside of the boxes where it's not gonna bother them. So just some interesting things. This is still, in my opinion, the number one enemy of the beekeeper. Uh, or of honeybees is the varroa mite. Okay, people want to think their idea of reality is real, but it's not. This is reality right here. And if they aren't kept in check, they will kill your bees. And all the wishing it wouldn't happen isn't going to change that. Okay? Do you know your levels? Do you know your levels? I think Randy Oliver was asked what he thought of the commercial uh, mite washers or the, the CO2 mite washers. I use the two jars with a piece of wire mesh. I don't worry about any of that other stuff. And you know what? I can compare apples to apples every time I do it. And uh, I try to keep it simple. But you gotta know what your levels are. And if you're not looking um, you, and you're just applying treatments, you may be wasting money, you may be applying things that don't work and assuming they did work. Just because it's sold in a bee supply catalog doesn't mean it's necessary or it works. Varroa check, as far as I'm concerned, all new starch should be treated with apivar and anything that's not making a honey crop. Okay, after you know what your levels are. If they need to be treated, apivar still, from my perspective, 98% effective. Check before and two weeks after treatment to see if it worked. And uh, the alcohol washer, in my opinion, is the most foolproof method of determining that. You want to use 300 bees off of open brood, which is about a half a cup. You want to obviously make sure the queen is not on there, and I think that's why a lot of beekeepers don't use the alcohol washers. They're not sure if the queen is on the frame or not. One way that, you, the, the, one of the things that I do is if there's a tremendous amount of bees on a frame, is I will shake some of them off back into the hive and then look. 
If there's less workers, it's much easier to see the queen than if they're you know, too deep on top of each other, okay? The other thing is if I'm with a beekeeper, I have them look at the same time, so we got two sets of eyes. Um, and you just wanna make sure that she's not on there, but it's all, um, there's a degree of, um, what would you call it? Statistics are that she's probably not gonna be on there if there's 18 or 20 frames and you shook the bees off and you don't see her there and you look twice or three times and you don't see her there, it's probably not there, okay? Um, wash for, you wanna put them in a half a cup with about a cup of alcohol, one to two cups of alcohol, wash for about 30 seconds and count the mites, divide by three and that would give you your percent infestation. And that's generally what I do. That's the tub I collect them in, right there. I've seen people say if you roll your, your alcohol jar down the side of the frame, they roll into it. I would not do that. Um, it just, it never works that well for me. I take the frame and I shake it over top of this wash tub, pick the tub up and tap the bees to one end and I can get two scoops in about two seconds. And then put all the rest of the bees right back into the hive. Okay, there's the washer, there's the scoop half cup. You got to know what you're dealing with. And then here are the varroa mites in the bottom. So far this year I've seen zero percent, I mean within the last three weeks, zero percent up to about uh, 14 percent. You heard what Randy said earlier, you get much over five or seven percent or it might have been um, Jerry, that that colony's dead and doesn't know it yet. Okay. So that's not always the case, but it, but it, it doesn't, it's not that great, especially as, uh, as the season progresses and if you have virus circulating as well. That's a lot of problems coming up. If you wanna see how to do this, Kevin England did a couple videos, uh, and I did one with, with a friend of Landy Simone's, and you can go to these two places and watch them. They're right on the New Jersey Department of Agriculture Bee Inspection webpage. If you Google searched it, you'd see it right there. Deformed wing virus. You've already seen pictures of that today. That's bad news. It takes a while. You can, you can knock mites down relatively quickly, but it takes a while for virus to circulate out. That's why it's important to stay on top of your, your mite level um, in your colonies as, as you come into the dearth period to make sure that, um, that you know what's going on and you have these, uh, the mite levels as low as possible. To be a, a good beekeeper or a successful beekeeper, you need to be a, a good Varroa manager. And you've probably heard me say that ad nauseum. But the reason I keep saying it is because people don't do it. Or new people get in thinking they're gonna save the bees. And in fact, they're killing the bees because they're not taking care of their mite levels. Okay? Everyone should treat. Check your mite levels before and two weeks after treatment. Check mite levels monthly. Alcohol wash, keep records. This is what Jeff Harris said from Mississippi State. He wrote an article in the Bee Culture or Bee Journal, April of 2015. These people swore to him they didn't have Varroa. He went out there with a microscope, scraped up all the debris off their dead hive's bottom board, put them under the microscope, and showed them thousands of Varroa mites. Okay? Just because they didn't see them with their eyes, they thought they didn't have them. Randy Oliver said this when he came to the, to the state beekeepers meeting about five years ago. Why is it that if a person doesn't treat a dog with mange, they're considered inhumane, but if they don't treat their bees for a controllable parasitic infection, they're not, they don't consider themselves inhumane? I still don't know the answer to that question. Okay, but the best thing you could do for your neighbors is treat your bees and control parasitic mites in those colonies. That's the best thing you could do for other beekeepers that are near you. This is what I say. People tell me they got into, bee, into beekeeping to save, quote unquote, the bees. And yet there was even a, a college bee club called Save, because they were gonna save the bees. But they didn't do anything to control varroa mites and they killed all their bees. And I just think that's extremely ironic, okay? In fact, they're, they're killing the bees because they refuse to manage the mites in their colonies. In fact, they're spreading their problems to their neighbors as their colonies collapse. And in fact, they're wasting a significant amount of their own money. If you want to waste your own money, it doesn't bother me. OK? 
Okay, but when you infect all your, all your neighbors' beehives, that bothers me. That bothers me. Effective treatments, these, these, are, these are the main treatments that are used. They're effective to one degree or another, but they're not all equally effective. I want you to understand that, okay? Um, Apolife VAR, Mitoway Quick Strip, Apigard, they'll kill mites, but they're not getting rid of 90% 90, 90 of them in my experience, okay? So there's always a remnant left over. Apovar, in my opinion, most effective. And here's one of the reasons why I say that. I've used it in my own apiaries for the last three years. And every spring, I've not seen one varroa mite in the burr cone between the two boxes when I work them in the spring. I used all these other ones for many years, and I always saw a tremendous amount of varroa mites in the burr comb between the two boxes every spring. And it always made me extremely nervous, okay? Oxalic acid. Oh, here's this, this, is a, this is a really important thing. I just talked to a beekeeper two days ago who was using strips from last year. She bought a 50 pack because it's more efficient or more cost effective for her. And she saved the strips from last year in the open foil pack to use this year. That's about as good as doing nothing. Okay, because the minute you open the foil pack, it starts to lose its active ingredient. Can't you freeze them? No. Nothing you can do? No. Well, you can do whatever you want to do, but I'm telling you, it's not going to be effective. The manufacturer says once that foil pack is open, they need to be used, okay? If, if, if you have a lot of high of colonies, you want to buy 50 packs and 10 packs. So if it's the end of the day or, or you're not going to do it for a week, you try to only open what you need, okay? Um, I know, yeah. So I just want to tell you that because keeping them and using them um, a long time after that pack was open is not going to be helpful to you. Oxalic acid dribble or oxalic acid, only really effective when a colony is broodless. I hear a lot of people talk about vaporization and I got no problem with it as long as you use protective uh, respirators and you're, you're protecting yourself and making sure that your acid plume is not blowing through your neighbor's backyard when they're having a birthday party for their kid, right? Um, but it's not going to work unless, it's not really going to be that effective unless the colony is broodless. So in my opinion, it's not really something for, um, that's going to do the bulk of your mite control. You're going to rely on one of these others, okay? But this is something that will kill the mite in a different, a different way and help to prevent resistance from developing to any of the others. And it's also, I think, a good way to clean a colony up if it got reinfected late in the season. Um, in New Jersey, in most of New Jersey, you probably wouldn't want to use vaporization until you, we get into the Thanksgiving time period to have it be really effective, okay? Um, the dribble, I know I have friends that use dribble. They use it on smaller colonies and stuff like that. Um, I never really used it because in the fall, I come from a, from a livestock background, cattle, hogs, chickens, and everything I know when it's cold weather, the last thing I want to do is put anything wet on any livestock I'm taking care of, okay? And I just don't really like putting cold, wet syrup on my bees at Thanksgiving time. So I've, I've been hesitant to do it, and I don't do it. This is just some of our data from our winter death loss surveys. You can see this is the average. Okay, this was last year's survey, 2016 to 2017. We had about 455 people participate, or beekeepers participate, which was great. It was a tremendous amount more than the last year. And I think one of the reasons it worked so well is because we nagged you to death. Okay, so you'll probably get nagged to death again this year um, because the, the data is much better if you do that. Um, but you can see here total death loss was about 29%, but look at the difference between these two numbers. These are people that said they did something to control Varroas, and these are people that did nothing to control Varroa. Or I'm sorry, right here. And then this is the average of those two over time. 
I mean, e even our little survey in New Jersey would show that doing something to control Varroa is 10 times better than doing nothing. And I will tell you guys that some of these people used Apistan, and some of them used Kumafos. And both of those products are not effective anymore, even though they're sold, okay? So I would recommend you don't use them. Other issues, municipal complaints, we still get them. Some of the common things are bees are too close to the property line. Uh, they, you're, you're, the beekeeper's bees swarm into the neighbor's backyard. Their kid's afraid to go outside. Um, can't go by my pool because your bees are drinking from my pool. And I will tell you right now, you really need to have water available probably in February, because once the pollen starts coming in, the colony is brooding up, the bees are foraging for water. And if you wait till July to put out water, the bees already have their water source and nothing you can do is gonna get them to come to your water source unless you dry up the, the water source where they're already getting it from. And if that happens to be your neighbor's pool or koi pond or whatever, and if your neighbor don't like you or you don't like your neighbor, guess what? You get bees, you're going to have an even bigger problem because they're going to not like you even more. Um, and my attitude is try to be the best neighbor you could possibly be. You know, the theme this morning was about working together, whether it be with industry, uh, with beekeepers. Um, um, it, the only way we're going to solve problems is if we can work together, even if you don't like me and I don't like you, or I don't agree with you and you don't agree with me. That still doesn't mean we, we can't work together and try to solve something, okay? If, you, if you're keeping bees in a suburban setting, I've seen many people use queen excluders, unknowing, not really knowing how to use them. And here's a, for instance, a double deep full of bees. They slap a queen excluder on and then put a box of foundation over top of it. The bees are never gonna go through a queen excluder to work a box of foundation. And what happens is the colony plugs out the second deep, makes, runs out of room, makes queen cells, and swarms. The beekeeper doesn't get honey. The swarm lands in the neighbor's backyard, which infuriates them, and it just becomes a, a vicious cycle. I would urge you to try to manage your bees if you live in an urban area or a very close neighborhood without using queen excluders and give your bees plenty of room as early as you can in the spring. You want to keep them home so you make a honey crop and you want to, um, uh, and you can minimize as much problems with neighbors as possible. Swarm lures. You know, if you ever took a beekeeping class that I, that I was involved with teaching years ago, and Bob Hughes was involved with teaching, Bob, if you told me and Bob back then that swarm lures work, we'd have laughed right in your face. But I'll tell you, last year at EAS at Stockton, a swarm flew out of, out of a hive and landed in the top of a pine tree 30 feet off the ground. And one of the vendors was from a swarm lure company. And he came out and hung, us, hung his swarm lure on that tree. And I looked at that, and th if you could have read the bubble in my mind, you would have thought, okay. And I, it wasn't within a half hour that swarm got up. I thought it was leaving. It went around behind the building. It came right down and landed right on that swarm lure. And I thought, that's pretty impressive. And I'm a firm believer of them ever since. So I keep them. I have it in my truck. I put them in some bait hive boxes around my apiaries because I think they work pretty good and I would encourage you to use them. Um, now, I already, that, I already talked about that. Water, a water source can be as much as a, a mortar pan with some stones in it and you just keep it filled with water. If you go away on vacation for two weeks in July and it hasn't rained for a month and the water dries up while you're gone, guess what, the bees are gonna go somewhere else and find water. My wife has, we have sheep and goats, and the summer before this past summer, they had been drinking from a water trough that was outside of our livestock area. That water trough dried up when we were on vacation, or it might have been when we were at EAS, because it was hot and dry last that year. And uh, we got home, they were drinking right where the sheep drink. And Patty said she filled up their regular drinker, drinker again, and they never went back to it all summer long. The only way we could get them is if we dump out the sheep water 
and make that dry and force them to go to that other order, okay? And they were only two feet away. They're creatures of habit, and once they start doing something, they're gonna keep on doing it. Feeding. We talk, I, I bring this up because I felt fielded a lot of questions about feeding recently. And one of these questions is feeding during the dearth, okay? I've seen many times where people, especially in goldenrod areas, would harvest their honey early July, late June. Then their colonies go into the dearth period, waiting for the goldenrod flow. And what happens is if there's not enough carbohydrate in there, as I said just a few minutes ago, the bees will eat back the eggs, eat back the larva, and the colony um, brood nests and populations start to shrink. And I will tell you that if you, did, if, that, if you were in that area and you did a little bit of feeding sugar syrup during the dearth, that would help to maintain your brood nest so when the goldenrod finally did turn on, you'd have a good population to make a much better honey crop. Normally what happens is when the goldenrod turns on, the colony just builds back what it lost and maybe gets enough for the winter. But if you had a good full brood nest with a large population of bees, you'd be better able to capitalize on that, on that food resource and maybe even make a surplus. Um, another reason to feed is to stimulate brood production, and that could be either in the spring or the fall. Where I live in the southern end of the Pine Barrens, there's nothing after 4th of July, or maybe after sumac. And what, what I do is feed thin syrup just so that I can have a large population of young bees. For many years, I tried to leave a, a deep box full of honey on them, um, only harvest what was over and above that deep, and what would happen is I'd go into winter with a small cluster of old bees because the queens had shut down sometime in August, early September. They had plenty of weight and plenty of food but they did not have long-lived, fat winter bees, and those colonies would end up dying. The only way I can overcome that in the area where I live is by feeding thin syrup August and early September to really get my population boosted up of young bees going into winter. At the same time, I control my mites, make sure those levels are down, so that those bees that are gonna go into winter are non-parasitized, have not been bitten by a, by a varroa. You, had, you need to look in the hive, you can't assume anything. Flight does not correlate to honey. I looked at a guy's bees not that long ago that starved to death in August. And he said, but Tim, I'm watching them from my kitchen window and the flight just crazy coming and going out of the hive. Crazy, and they're bringing in all kinds of pollen. I said, yeah, I said, pollen's great, but they gotta have carbohydrates too, they gotta have honey. He never went inside and looked. And you know, a colony that starves out in August looks a lot like a pesticide spray. And most people that call me up tell me they were sprayed by a pesticide, but when you go out there and investigate it further, they were starved to death by beekeeper neglect. So I bring that up because most people don't know that that can happen. And I uh, just want you to not assume anything, but make sure you look at what's going on inside your colonies. Okay? Gotta be fat for the winter. I'm trying to get thin for the winter. <laughs> I used to be fat all year round. With bees, being fat is good. With people, and not that great. <laughs> Feeder type. There's a lot of different types of feeders, and they kind of have their pros and cons, and I just thought I'd run through that briefly. Division board feeder. I was never a big fan of them. A friend of mine uh, convinced me to start putting them in my brood nest. And this past year, when, that, when those weather conditions turned south, my bees were brooded up, ready to be split, but it was too cold to do it. And I went around and fed everyone about a gallon and a half of syrup, and I believe it saved me probably from losing 50 or 100 hives. That's how short we were on food last spring. If I'd, have, if I'd have had to go around and put a hive top feeder on every one of them and then put syrup in it, I would have never had the time to do that. I just lifted those boxes, put syrup in the bottom, and boom, saved my butt. So I'm a strong proponent from that standpoint. 
Um, the division board with cap and ladder is a good type of a feeder if you're going to feed the bees just a little bit of syrup to carry them through the dearth. You don't want them to take it too fast. You want them to be able to get it relatively slowly so they can keep the brood nest populated and juicy. Um, the friction feeder jar or pail, great way to feed them on top. But when the weather gets too cold and we have those changes in temperature from cold to hot, cold to hot throughout the day, a lot of times it pushes syrup out on the bees. And if they're not able to handle the volume that's being pushed out on them, it can cause a problem. Hive top feeder, I like them if you're trying to draw comb or if your bees are starving like mine do down where I live, because I, I live in a crappy bee area, um, I can put a lot of feed on them very quickly, okay? Um, fondant works fine in the winter, but ideally I, I try not to ever use it because I want my bees fat enough in the fall so I don't have to do anything in the winter. Okay? Fondant is like a saves, you from, saves your bees from dying type of feed, okay? in my opinion. Shouldn't just be put on willy-nilly. And here's something that I, that I believe happens more than we think, especially in these years with a tremendous amount of swarming. Is Sometimes people that aren't really looking to expand or aren't really, really looking to produce nucleuses, they read that other people are putting on pollen patties and feeding liquid syrup in uh, mid-March and uh, putting on fondant throughout the whole winter, and they think they have to do it. And what happens is your colony gets, gets so strong that before the major honey flow comes and before you can manage it correctly, they swarm. And now you're kind of behind the eight ball. If you're just trying to make honey for your own enjoyment, I think you'd be better off making sure they're not starving, but rather than feeding them super early to get them super strong, just let them build up as the natural pollen and nectar's coming in and just follow that natural cycle. Um, so that's my opinion on that because I see a tremendous amount of that early swarming happening because people are, are following the bell sheep that's ahead of them, telling them, oh, you have to feed pollen patties, and you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you don't have to do any of that. It depends on what you're trying to do with your colonies. If you're just trying to make honey for your family and have a, have a fun hobby, no need to do all that stuff, okay? Here's a shot of some cannibalized brood. See, they're tearing that out. They've uncapped some of these. And if you look here, there's no eggs in any of these cells. They've all been eaten. That might be a larva there. I can't tell from here. But um, pretty much that's all that's left in there. And that can be caused by, by not enough food. One of the other presentations showed these shots of feces. This is Varroa feces. They're a lot like pigs. You know, if you ever raised pigs, pigs crap all in one area. And they're pretty clean about it, right? And varroas do the same thing. It's usually in the top of the cell, and you'll see these little uh, white feces piles. Um, this was a colony that died, and as part of trying to figure out why it died, that's one of the things I like to look for. Um, so I just want to talk to you briefly. Most of you know that I've, I've gone to Malawi, Africa several times. Um, maybe you'd like to come to Malawi to see how poor people are earning money with beekeeping. It's a primitive place. It's about a fourth world country. It's, uh, where is it? It's right here. It's this long sliver of a country surrounded by Mozambique. Okay? And uh, they keep their hives in top bar hives. Or they keep their bees in top bar hives. Here they are harvesting honey. They're brushing them off. The bees are fighting them back. Um, here's, a, here's a hive that was all getting rotted by weather and ants. We swapped the bees into a new hive. Um, they do some solar wax harvesting after they've crushed and strained uh, the honey out of their combs. Um, I'm, I'm associated with an organization called Villages in Partnership, and we're going on a trip to Africa with a beekeeping emphasis. We're going to look at their beekeeping operations. And maybe you'd be, able, you'd be able to come, teach them something about something you love, and uh, it's up to you, but I just thought I'd, I'd let you know that that was going to happen this coming February, and uh, it's right around February 27th to March 5th. And uh, it's kind of a, 
It'll be, it would be very cool. This is what usually it costs. The airfare maybe be 900 bucks to 1,000 bucks. Transportation and all this other stuff, plus a 24-hour visit to a nice safari park, five-star hotel type of accommodation. Um, and uh, if you're interested in something like that, you can come and see me and I can tell you more about it. The other thing Janet alleviated to earlier, or alluded to earlier, and so did some of the speakers about being involved. Do you want to help the New Jersey Beekeepers Association? What's your expertise? You may have extra time. You may want to help this organization be a better organization. But here's the key. You need to be able to work with people who don't always agree with you. A lot of people in this dead generation can't do that, okay? You got to be able to see the bigger picture. There's a better good by all of us working together to solve problems rather than fighting against each other, creating problems. Um, there's areas that we need help. You can come talk to Janet, you can talk to me, you can talk to the president of your local chapter. Uh, one of the reasons this organization is as good as it is today is because of people like you uh, volunteered some time to do things that they were really good at, okay? And, uh, you know, I'll be the first one to admit that I stink at a lot of stuff, okay? My wife would be first to remind you of that. She told me the reason our marriage is so great is because she has very low expectations and I meet them on a regular basis. <laughs> and you know what? Low expectations take a hell of a lot of burden off your back. I got to be honest with you. I kind of like that. Um, you know what? These are some of the good things that we've had working together. Disease detection. I can't tell you how many beekeepers call me up now and say, hey, Tim, I think I have American fowl brood. And of course, I'm skeptical when they say that. But I ask them a bunch of questions. And then usually I've been saying, I think I'm coming out to take a look at them tomorrow. And in a lot of instances, it's because the beekeeper identified it first. That's huge because you don't see that in a lot of places. Winter death loss survey. We have, what, eight or nine years of records. And now we have a, a master's student who's, who's, who's better at evaluating statistics than Tim Schuler ever will be, looking at that information, trying to give us some real good information from it. The calendar project that uh, Rebecca Wunderlich has been asking for your pictures. Please send your pictures. I'll tell you, Martine's been running around here. She's our new newsletter editor. She wants pictures. Um, so if, if you can, see her before you leave. If you have any good beekeeping pictures and send them to her, they'll go in our, in our bi-monthly newsletter. Um, this USDA honeybee survey, the honey shows in the Capitol building, I'm telling you, the deal is not for you to win. The deal is for you to show the legislature and the government officials how many people keep bees in New Jersey. So save three stinking one pound jars and enter the show, please, really. That, that's the goal of it. Um, pollinator protection, grant, the meadow project, bee spill plan, online registration, all this stuff happened because people worked together uh, to do something good. And, um, and you know what? If, you, if you're interested in doing that, I'm sure there's a place for you to do something in this organization. With that, I say goodbye. <laughs>